Hello, my name is Susan Wilbanks. I am one of the worship leaders at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in the Green Lake neighborhood in Seattle, and I'd like to welcome you to evening prayer for this Ash Wednesday, February the 17th. Throughout this service, I'll be giving you directions on where to find the various prayers and readings in your Book of Common Prayer. I'll do my best to allow enough time to move through the book and find your place, but if you don't have a copy of the Book of Common Prayer, or if you find all the flipping back and forth distracting, please know that you are also welcome to just listen along and reflect on the words. And if you are following along in your Book of Common Prayer, we will be beginning on page 116. If I say, Surely the darkness will cover me, and the light around me turn to night. Darkness is not dark to you, O Lord. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. And now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Then, continuing to the invitatory, O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen, alleluia. This evening's Psalms are Psalms 102 and 130. We will pray them together. First, Psalm 102 begins on page 731. Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come before you. Hide not your face from me in the day of trouble. Incline your ear to me when I call. Make haste to answer me. For my days drift away like smoke, and my bones are hot as burning coals. My heart is smitten like grass and withered, so that I forget to eat my bread. Because of the voice of my groaning, I am but skin and bones. I have become like a vulture in the wilderness, like an owl among the ruins. I lie awake and groan. I am like a sparrow, lonely on a housetop. My enemies revile me all day long, and those who scoff at me have taken an oath against me. For I have eaten ashes for bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Because of your indignation and wrath, you have lifted me up and thrown me away. My days pass away like a shadow, and I wither like the grass. But you, O oh Lord, endure forever, and your name from age to age. You will arise and have compassion on Zion, for it is time to have mercy upon her. Indeed, the appointed time has come. For your servants love her very rubble, and are moved to pity even for her dust. The nations shall fear your name, O oh Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord will build up Zion and his glory will appear. He will look with favor on the prayer of the homeless. He will not despise their plea. Let this be written for a future generation so that a people yet unborn may praise the Lord. For the Lord looked down from his holy place on high, from the heavens he beheld the earth, that he might hear the groan of the captive and set free those condemned to die, that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord and his praise in Jerusalem. When the peoples are gathered together and the kingdoms also to serve the Lord, 
He has brought down my strength before my time. He has shortened the number of my days. And I said, oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years endure throughout all generations. In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They shall perish, but you will endure. They shall all wear out like a garment. As clothing, you will change them, and they shall be changed. But you are always the same, and your years will never end. The children of your servants shall continue, and their offspring shall stand fast in your sight. And now, please turn forward to page 784 for Psalm 130. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to note what is done, am done amiss, O Lord, who could stand? For there is forgiveness with you, therefore you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 4, verse 11. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his, his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I know that you are a gracious, a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat in it under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you were concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night, and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about, this, about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. And now, please turn to Canticle 10 on page 86, the second song of Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he wills to be found. Call upon him when he draws near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the evil ones their thoughts and let them turn to the Lord and he will have compassion and to our God for he will richly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as rain and snow fall from the heavens and return not again, but water the earth, bringing forth life and giving growth, seed for sowing and bread for eating, so is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I have purposed and prosper in that for which I sent it. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Before I talk about my thoughts on this night's reading from the book of Jonah, I want to reflect a little on the journey we've been on as a church, as a community, as a country, as a world, since last Ash Wednesday. I'm pretty sure last year's midday Ash Wednesday service was the last time I attended a physical service and received the Eucharist at St. Andrews. I remember being already very aware of COVID-19, both because I work in research administration at UW and it was you know, very much the talk of you know, that community there where we have so many people in medical research and because I'm a news junkie married to a husband who's even more of a news junkie, especially on public health issues. So I was already expecting the state would go into some kind of lockdown soon. If you'd told me we weren't going to have in-person services on, in church that Easter, I wouldn't have been at all surprised. It was really what I was expecting. But if you told me we'd still be in the depths of the pandemic when the Lenten season rolled around again in 2021, I would have been stunned. And yet here we are. While we now have hope that with the vaccine rollout of returning to our normal lives, or at least of building a new normal, we are still waiting. Personally, I'm not trying to, I'm trying not to, to set my heart on any one event, whether it's going to a Mariners game on the 4th of July weekend, or even being able to enjoy singing carols at this year's Christmas Eve service, or the Messiah sing-along that's still 10 months from now. There's a passage in C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters to the effect that humans get easily trapped into sins of impatience, frustration, and reckless behavior by deciding we can endure whatever trial we are facing for a reasonable time, and then losing it as soon as we deem the length of the trial has become unreasonable. This last year has absolutely felt unreasonable. And so I'm trying to, to face what remains of this trial for radical acceptance of each day as it comes. Moving on to Jonah, I find this passage fascinating as we enter Lent, the season of repentance, and also as we look at the strife and unrest we've been facing as a nation. The book of Jonah, in my belief, is something of a fable. To be honest, I don't believe that Jonah lived three days after being swallowed by a whale, and to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing in history about the people of the Assyrian city of Nineveh repenting of their imperial ways and becoming worshipers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I do believe that this fable is packed with truth about the nature of God and about human nature. So there are big lessons for us to learn from it. In the ancient history of the Near East, the smaller peoples of the Fertile Crescent including the Israelites, spent many centuries either fending off or being conquered by the great emperors of the great empires of that region, in particular Babylon, Assyria, and Persia. And from the perspective of these smaller peoples who were being conquered, the Assyrians were the worst of their imperial enemies by many measures, largely because of their practice of deporting people away from their homelands to break their cultures, religions, and political resistance and make them good Assyrian subjects. If you've heard of the lost tribes of Israel, 
this is how they were lost when Assyria conquered the kingdom of Israel and resettled its people. And if any of this story about how the Assyrians treated the people that, that they conquered sounds like America's dealings with the Native Americans, then you're, you're reading this on the same page as I am. So here in the book of Jonah, we have a story where God sends a prophet to speak to his very worst enemies, a people out to destroy his very nation and identity. It makes you understand why Jonah's first response was to run in the opposite direction and why he's angry at God for giving him a chance, giving them a chance to repent. I could see myself acting the very same way. I don't expect those I consider enemies to repent. I'd for sure resist if I felt like God was sending me on a mission to the peoples and places I consider most Nineveh-like in my own world. And to use a very real example, um, speaking from my perspective, if I was sent on a message to the capital insur sent on a mission by God to the capital capital insurrectionist, I would be like, "Really, God? You think that's useful? You think there's any chance these people will change?" I would definitely fight back. So the biggest lesson of Jonah is that that response is not the right response, that God's mercy and forgiveness is extended to everyone, even to our worst enemies. In the position of privilege I have as a white American, I don't have any enemies that are as bad for me as the, as the Assyrians were to the Israelites. So if God could send Jonah to the Assyrians, I don't have any enemies who are worse than that. And if God's forgiveness ascended, um, if God's forgiveness extended to them, it could extend to anyone. And so if we are the people of God, we do need to be willing to accept that even our worst enemies are capable of change and repentance and to be ready to welcome them if they do. I do, however, want to add a caveat I don't believe that God is asking us to ignore wrongdoing or to compromise our own values about justice and truth. The reason that God had mercy on the people of Nineveh in this story is because they did hear his message and repent. And so our calling is to believe that people can change through the grace of God, not to pretend there's no need to change or to ignore the needs of the victims in our rush to forgive the offenders because God calls us to reflect both his justice and mercy. And what Jonah shows us is that his mercy is beyond our fathoming. And now turning to page 120 of the prayer book, let us say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Continuing to page 121, we will begin the prayers with the contemporary version of the Lord's Prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Then continuing to suffrage B on page 122. That this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful, we entreat you, O Lord. That your holy angels may lead us in paths of peace and goodwill, we entreat you, O Lord, that we may be pardoned and forgiven for our sins and offenses. We entreat you, O Lord, that there may be peace to your church and to the whole world. We entreat you, O Lord, that we may depart this life in your faith and fear, 
and not be condemned before the great judgment seat of Christ, we entreat you, O Lord, that we may be bound together by your Holy Spirit in the communion of all your saints, entrusting one another and all our life to Christ. We entreat you, O Lord. Our first collect for Ash Wednesday is on the bottom of page 217. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Next, we will pray the Collect for Social Justice on page 260. Almighty God, who created us in your own image, grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression, and that we may reverently use our freedom, help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations, to the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now turning to the collect at the top of page 125. O God, you manifest in your servants the signs of your presence. Send forth upon us the spirit of love, that in companionship with one another, your abounding grace may increase among us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I now invite your prayers and thanksgivings, either silently or aloud. As the pandemic continues, we continue to pray for doctors, nurses, and all healthcare workers. Sanctify, O Lord, those whom you have called to the study and practice of the arts of healing and to the prevention of disease and pain. Strengthen them by your life-giving spirit, that by their ministries, the health of the community may be promoted and your creation glorified through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we will say together the general thanksgiving on page 125. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. This concludes our evening prayers. Thank you for joining us and I wish you a blessed Lenten season.